So now we're going to move beyond nitrogen. Nitrogen is not the only element that in insects is enriched, it's higher relative to the plants uh, that they eat. And I'm focusing on plants really because this is the majority of insects uh, do this and they form the resource base for uh, many other things. So here, for example, you can see kind of where the elemental composition of insects is in these dots. And this is the average that you tend to find in plants for potassium, for phosphorus. Uh, there's a few where it's actually a little bit higher in the plants than it is in insects. But again, insects tend to have greater demands of those uh, elements than, uh, than their resources uh, generally have. So this field of uh, ecological stoichiometry tries to uh, understand the relative balance, not just the absolute amounts, of the key elements uh, in organisms across different trophic levels. And what I mean by that is plants versus their herbivores, just as an, as an example. It, and it helps understand plant herbivore interactions or consumer resource interactions more broadly, and specifically what the constraints are that nutrient deficient food places on consumers. Now, we talked about nitrogen a lot in the previous video. Uh, carbon is also an important molecule that's re required for, for energy, nitrogen for protein synthesis. And phosphorus is another uh, molecule that is, uh, that is also quite important. And that's because the genetic material and the translation um, um, information material that cells use is phosphorus based. So things like DNA and RNA have a phosphorus backbone and therefore for rapidly growing organisms that require a lot of protein synthesis and a lot of messenger RNA and a lot of cell division to actually happen, phosphorus can be in quite high demand because you have to make more of it as your cells uh, get bigger. So this is again the pattern that I showed uh, earlier highlights the differences between uh, the resource of most insects, plants, um, what the concentration of nitrogen and phosphorus is in them, and what the concentration of those uh, elements is for herbivores. So we already said that there's about a five-fold higher demand of nitrogen in insects compared to their host plants. There's actually a tenfold higher demand in the tissues of insects for phosphorus compared to their uh, host plants. And this is even more magnified for insects that are detritivores because detritus, dead plant material, has even lower uh, phosphorus concentration than, uh, than plants do. All organisms are comprised of these same major elements, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus. But the relative balance of these elements differs vastly between organisms occupying different trophic levels. The optimal situation for animals is for their body composition, their carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, to closely match that of their resources. And nutritional imbalances created by uh, organisms, organisms feeding at these lower trophic levels on nutrient deficient uh, foods, nutrient deficient in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus, can severely hamper their ability to meet their nutrient demands. And so the stoichiometric mismatch in nitrogen content between plants and insects has really been recognized for decades as imposing a fundamental limitation on uh, resource uh, acquisition. And similarly, uh, phosphorus limitation has been shown to have widespread effects in aquatic systems. So here is a pattern from a synthesis done by Jim Elser, uh, who's one of the uh, people who really dove deep into this particular field, that looked at the carbon to nitrogen ratio of uh, uh, plants, uh, I should say autotrophs, plants and algae, uh, other things, plankton, um, phytoplankton growing in aquatic systems, in terrestrial systems versus uh, freshwater systems. And what's interesting here is that as these numbers get bigger, that means there's more carbon relative to nitrogen in the tissues of those, uh, of those organisms. So here is... The, the numbers get bigger and bigger. And again, bigger number means the denominator is small in the carbon to nit nitrogen ratio, which means there's less nitrogen to more carbon. And, in, um, and for terrestrial plants, 
the average ratio is somewhere here in the uh, 36 range, I think is the average, but there's quite a bit of a spread. For aquatic autotrophs, this ratio is actually closer to 10, meaning that there's relatively more nitrogen to carbon in aquatic um, autotrophs. If you look at invertebrate herbivores here in terrestrial systems, you'll find that the uh, average ratio is somewhere here in the five uh, to six range. And this is true for both terrestrial and aquatic uh, herbivores. So when you compare the needs of uh, invertebrates to their producers, uh, the tissues that they're feeding on, and you try to match the stoichiometric needs of the insect, then insects doesn't just need an amount of nitrogen, it needs the right balance of nitrogen and carbon in its tissues. That mismatch is greatest in terrestrial systems than it is in uh, aquatic systems. The, the C to N ratio for freshwater uh, autotrophs is 10, and the freshwater consumers is about 6. So this is a lot closer than 6 is to 36, uh, for, for example. And you can see the same kinds of mismatches for the carbon to phosphorus uh, ratios here, where insects have about a C to P ratio of about 100, and plants are at about 1,000. Uh, here, terrestrial plants are at about 1,000. So a big mismatch. So here, for example, is also a relationship uh, between uh, insect performance, weevil abundance. You could think of this as, a, as an indicator of performance feeding on high phosphorus plants, that is, high phosphorus relative to carbon, so a low ratio, a bigger denominator versus the, the numerator. Insect abundance tends to be higher compared to situations where there's less phosphorus to carbon, so relatively low phosphorus is, is out here. So very similar to that carbon to nitrogen story where low phosphorus relative to carbon means less uh, lower performance. Problems of obtaining adequate nourishment arise because plants and animals differ so greatly in their chemical composition. Insects have a high nitrogen compound, but plants are composed predominantly of indigestible carbohydrates like cellulose and lignin. And so they have a lot of carbon, but a lot of that carbon is not easily accessible by most insects. And this discrepancy creates problems for insects as they're trying to get that nitrogen because for insects nitrogen seems to be the most uh, is the most uh, important element so another way to say this is not everything green that's out there is uh, is edible an important concept to uh, recognize here when you're talking about stoichiometry is that as an insect feeds on a plant they can't be necessarily picky about uh, just grabbing the nitrogen, for example, or just grabbing the carbon. As they feed on a leaf or as they feed on the phloem, they get everything. They get that stoichiometric ratio of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and everything else that comes, uh, that comes from it. So here's an example of a stoichiometric ratio. Um, as you can see these uh, little wheat berries here. You can imagine that that's carbon. These little beans that I put into this jar here, these are maybe proteins uh, or amino acids. And what I really want is the proteins. What I really want is the little black ones uh, because that's where my limiting, uh, organ my limiting uh, nutrients are. But as an herbivore and I'm a leaf chewer, I have to eat the whole thing. So I get this, this entire thing when I chew on a leaf. And therefore, I'm taking in a lot of excess carbon as I'm trying to get to the right, uh, the right amount of uh, nitrogen that is really what, uh, what is needed uh, for me. So how do, how do insects uh, actually do this? How do insects therefore deal with the fact that the foods that they're feeding on don't necessarily have the right stoichiometric ratios of uh, uh, nutrients of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus that they're actually trying to, uh, trying to get at? This model here uh, has uh, kind of come together uh, over the years, and this is a very nice review by uh, Spence Beamer at Texas A&M that I want to highlight, and it's, it's actually a beautifully written um, summary of this particular field. You can imagine here a situation where you have a certain amount of uh, protein that uh, insects are trying to get, a certain amount of carbohydrates that they're trying to get, carbon, 
to nitrogen. You can think of it as carbohydrates to proteins. That's a different way. And that an ideal uh, target for a particular uh, herbivore might be something that's here. And this is just arbitrarily picked. This is just as an illustration of an example. Uh, so 100 milligrams of protein and 100 milligrams of carbohydrates. But the plants that they're feeding on don't have a one-to-one -one ratio of carbon and nitrogen. They might have something that looks like this. You know, maybe it has more carbon to nitrogen. So this is maybe uh, 25 milligrams of nitrogen to every 100 milligrams of carbon. So if they were to feed only on this plant, the tissues of this insect here would always increase at this particular rate. And in fact, they would never get those 100 milligrams of protein, or they would take forever to get those 100 milligrams of protein by feeding only on this plant here, because they're getting a lot more carbon to nitrogen. Imagine another uh, resource, another plant uh, in the environment that actually has this ratio here, that has more nitrogen relative to carbon. So for every 100 units of, uh, or 150 units of uh, nitrogen, they get 50 milligrams of uh, carbohydrates. If this were the case, rock on. The insects are getting a lot of nitrogen, but they're not getting enough carbon and not getting enough carbohydrates. And they would have to eat a lot more tissue in order to get out here and get this, the right amount of, of carbon. So this provides a ch this creates that challenge, that mismatch, that stoichiometric mismatch between what a food resource has and what the insects are actually trying to achieve. If insects are generalists, that is, they can feed on more than just one plant, then what they can do is feed on a combination of these two food resources. In fact, if they fed on this resource for a little bit, and then they fed on, they would, their carbon to nitrogen ratio would increase at this rate. If they switched to feed on the, uh, the resource, the, the plant that has the blue line, then they would follow this trajectory now, parallel to that blue line here. If they were to switch at this point back to the orange uh, plant, uh, then their increase uh, in, uh, in carbon and nitrogen would increase at this rate here, with this slope here, and they would follow this trajectory. And so by flipping back and forth, they can basically mix their diets so that they can track their way to that idealized uh, ratio. Now, insects that can't mix their diets face a trade-off. So here's an example here where this plant here doesn't have the perfect match of the dietary needs of the insect. So what they could do is they could feed here up until this point, they would get enough carbohydrates, but they would be short this amount of uh, nitrogen, of the proteins, or they could keep feeding and get all the way to here, they would get just the right amount of proteins right here, but they would have this excess here of carbohydrates. And you could think that an optimal strategy would be to stop somewhere in between here so as to minimize the gaps between this one here and this one here. That mismatch, they either having too little or too much, actually creates a physiological stress on an organism. Actually having too much carbohydrate is actually not a good thing. Insects have to get rid of that. Uh, that's just too much, uh, too many carbohydrates, too much sugar that need to be processed out. And in, in doing so, they expend energy, which is costly to them. Energy that then they can't put in eggs, for example, or growth. On the other hand, uh, being uh, short on something like phosphorus, uh, I'm sorry, being short on something like nitrogen means that they've got just the right amount here, but they're not going to be able to grow uh, as rapidly. So minimizing this distance between these is one strategy that they could uh, they could actually use. When you go out and you actually look at what insects actually do, uh, either when they're given a choice or when they're forced, these are some of the uh, results that you get. Here on the x-axis is the protein to carbohydrate ratio. Now notice this is switched, it's nitrogen to carbon uh, ratio. So out here are plants that are um, uh, that have a one-to-one -one ratio, for example, of protein to carbohydrates. 
And what uh, Beamer and uh, Tony Jorn found was that the developmental time of grasshoppers that were fed plants or diet actually uh, that had about a one-to-one -one ratio, insects actually developed quicker on these plants and uh, uh, so they took less and they developed quicker when plants had this particular ratio here. When there was a mismatch between the diet and um, and and when uh, there was a deviation away from this particular ratio, there was either an increase, there was an, an increase in development time and a decrease in the, uh, in the growth rate. As it turns out, when you gave insects the ability to mix diets, they tended to mix their diets right here at around this particular ratio. So this is evidence that uh, insects when they're given the choice of mixing their own diet or when you feed them these uh, different combinations, uh, they tend to optimize. When you go out in a natural community and you look at where different species actually are, uh, what kinds of carbon to nitrogen ratios they're actually taking in, in a community of organisms that could potentially use the same uh, host plants, they found some really interesting patterns across these uh, seven species of uh, grasshoppers that are all in the same genus, what they found was that their trophic niche space was actually a little bit different between the different grasshoppers. There were some that tended to have a high intake of both uh, carbon, uh, both protein and carbohydrates, carbon and, and nitrogen. Others had slightly different ratios over here and that would allow them to uh, survive. And, uh, and not all of them were along these same trajectories. So they actually f had different carbon to nitrogen uh, ratios. This geometric framework is a relatively recent approach for dealing with the multivariate nutritional constraints on the level of macronutrients. Usually it's carbon and proteins that are looked at, but this could also be lipids and nitrogen or something else. Their conclusion in this particular study was that for these seven species that occur in the same location for these grasshoppers, the intake targets were distinctly different, potentially representing partitioning in niche space of their nutritional ecology in order to minimize uh, competition. So the take home messages here are that phytophagous insects, plant feeding insects, need multiple resources in order to develop both the elemental nutrients, amino acids, macronutrients, vitamins, and so on. And that it's the combination of all these together that really matters uh, for insects. So the stoichiometry, the relative ratios that, they, uh, that they're encountering, that matters uh, to them. And that the food resources that they feed on, plants primarily, are not optimal for them. They're variable, plants are often well defended, and not all carbon is potentially usable and not all nitrogen is potentially usable and therefore they provide less than adequate nutrition for all the needs and this creates a challenge for insects.